Okay, we're going to get started with the next panel. Um, so make, come on in. There's plenty of chairs. Um, but as people are settling in, I'm just going to start a very quick introduction to this next panel. Uh, my name is Daniel Dioka, and I'm a design critic in urban planning and design here at the GSD, as well as a co-founder and principal of Interboro Partners in New York. Very happy to have this uh, opportunity to moderate this panel, informal, temporary, DIY, spontaneous, pop-up, everyday, question mark. Actually, there are five question marks. Uh, quick, quick word about those question marks. They are not, as you might reasonably assume, uh, a uh, um, evidence of Professor Caden's uh, conference organizing induced exhaustion. Uh, they, they're, first of all, a reminder that this list could have gone on forever. Tactical, insurgent, guerrilla, hybrid, makeshift, loose. Uh, there are many more adjectives out there that could have been used to describe uh, recent currents in the work of a number of architects, planners, artists, pl uh, activists, question mark. Indeed, this list could have gone on forever, too. Truly, everyone is making public space uh, wherever, whenever. Uh, however, as uh, Gerald put it in the introduction to this panel, um, uh, as, as Gerald put it in the introduction to this panel, this is more or less, in fact, the premise of the American Pavilion at last year's Venice Biennale, uh, a fact that points to the um, arrivedness uh, of this movement, if you could call it a movement, and if you could call arrivedness a word. Uh, but uh, the, question, uh, the question marks are also a reminder that there are lots of uh, important questions to be asked about uh, this recent work, uh, many of which I hope we can uh, ask today. Um, here is Gerald again. Parking day converts parking, uh, converts parking spaces. Pop-up parks occupy abandoned waterfronts and other vacant land. Streets and islands within transform themselves through insertions of, of program and amenities. Is the in informality and or temporariness of such new uses in differently purposed places something to celebrate or a critical commentary on the relative absence of formal and per permanent public spaces? Um, I also hope, hope we can be a little uh, self-reflexive here and ask questions like, why now? Uh, who is this for? Um, it, it seems sometimes like uh, advocates assume that things like pop-up parks, parklets, guerrilla bike lanes, and other hallmarks uh, of the informal temporary DIY uh, movement um, benefit everyone, but surely there are losers. Who are they? Uh, is, there, is there a case to be made that we're simply building the kind of city that people like us want, uh, like and want to live in? Uh, what are our biases? That is to say, I think that with the popularity of this movement uh, comes a responsibility to look at it critically and ask critical questions. In any case, uh, if everyone's making public space, uh, one thing I think we can all agree on is not everyone is making public space as well as our distinguished panelists. Um, who we're all very lucky to have here, and who, by the way, uh, have varying and complex levels of allegiance uh, to temporary DIY, spontaneous, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you already have a program uh, containing bios. I'll only quickly introduce them. Uh, Christian Korman, co-founding uh, partner with Elma von Boxel of Zeus. Jim Lasko, co-artistic director of the Red Moon Theater, also a Lowe Fellow here at the GSD. Andres Power, chief of state to San Francisco supervisor Scott Wiener and the creator of the Pavement to Parks program. Uh, so a reminder, each speaker will have 20 minutes. Uh, then everyone will be done. We'll move over, sit in the comfortable chairs, and we will have a discussion. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Christian Korman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> um, I used those uh, five question marks to liberate myself a little bit. Uh, to not squeeze myself in or limit myself to only temporal, uh, temporality and call the lecture permanent temporality. Uh, because also yesterday there appeared a, a certain um, opposition between professional designers and community organizers. And, um, and uh, well, we believe that the permanent transformation and, and development can learn from the temporality and um, temporality is, is not very useful once it's not set in a larger context. So um, we as designers uh, are also very intrigued by human behavior and uh, spatial organization by, by people. But the problem of our discipline, I, I plead guilty here, is that we tend to uh, design everything. So. What we, we are become very aware of our own behavior as designers uh, doing these kind of things. 
So uh, I will just show you some things where we, yes, did a lot of design and squeezed people into walking within these flower beds, for instance, in Brussels um, in a certain way. And there was not a lot of pop up uh, going on here. Uh, or neither was in the process of the implementation of the Central Park in Shanghai, in which we uh, uh, won. But uh, even the design process was not very much uh, temporal or uh, participating in, in three months after the sketch it was implemented uh, so far. Um, or we, we, we tried to, to bridge the gap between urban planning, infrastructure, public domain, architecture by uh, proposing a bridge which is much more than a piece of infrastructure. Um, and also uh, thinking of how public space basically not ex exists in, in China because there's no character for public, it's only not private. Uh, we um, uh, use this idea to uh, generate an, an public space for the Dutch pavilion only um, uh, giving a, a platform with these objects which turned out to be sheep. Um, but it was easy for them to colonize this uh, public space and really, well, uh, to take those sheep everywhere and or even do what they do in uh, public space uh, mostly. But again, this was not as a designer, as, as an office, not very satisfying because it's delivering a design for uh, a context you partly don't know. So we started to theorize on our own role. And we wrote this manifesto, uh, Republic, which uh, claims that uh, architects and designers have become very passive animals in, in urban politics. And, if we want to become relevant again, then we have to be uh, aware that everything we do is very political and uh, we call this republic. And one of the um, aims was to start do thinking. So yes, we have to have a theory, but we have to also constantly uh, refresh this theory into doing. And I will explain you what we did the last six, seven years to execute this a self-created manifesto from our home base Rotterdam, which is this building was uh, vacant for 20 years in the midst of Rotterdam behind the Jean-Paul Cochet commercial uh, advertisement we have in our office, um, and used this as an observation post of, of the urban reality around us. And going back into history of this site, it is really downtown Rotterdam before the war. Well, Jane Jacobs would definitely uh, claim that this is, would be a, a good public space. But uh, we also uh, seen that now things have been changing and we just wondered how and why and who did this and, and what happened and what, what can we do about it. Uh, to go into a little bit of history, uh, the Germans helped us a little bit to give us a, a tabula rasa. <laughs> um, but then there's still two choices, war or you, we, we re, uh, retrofit the old urban fabric uh, or uh, yes, Robert Moses uh, was also in Rotterdam, uh, claimed to have uh, boulevards for cars, and, and this, of course, triggered a lot of grand-scale development, including the Mercedes dealer in the midst of the center, Texaco, Shell, and a Bambi deer camp. So uh, that, that has been um, in the 70s and 80s when capital really came into the city, uh, the kind of um, a development which ultimately led to what, what they tried to call Manhattan on the Mars, but of course, uh, <laughs> well, you know better. Um, but what, what you see here, and we, we took this picture uh, on purpose, is that it's a picture thing from the backside. So you see in front, you see the railway tr station uh, punching through the city center. There's these big boulevards, and there's this uh, crazy uh, office uh, business district here, uh, producing an enormous backside already for 20 years, uh, which basically looked like this. So if you, once you enter the high-speed train from Paris, then this would be your first encounter with Rotterdam. So it's not very welcoming to enter through the backside of a city. At the same time, in 2006, uh, there was a lot of um, well, crisis uh, already appearing, although nobody really wanted to admit this. So these big blocks, which were only 15 years old, were starting to look like this from the inside. But from the outside, you couldn't tell, so you thought it was a very prosperous kind of uh, urban development going on. Nevertheless, they kept on planning, planning uh, more of these office uh, blocks. So uh, the capital had to go somewhere. 
uh, and we just wondered uh, how this is possible. And we really became specialists of, uh, of all those ambitions and all those plans. There are about 200 documents which said something about this district, and we really read them all. We, uh, we tried to make uh, uh, connections between them, which, which the, the municipality didn't make yet, and try to understand how, what, what this is, who, what kind of public space this, this should lead to for who, and, um, and who, who's going to afford this uh, overall. So this is one of the schemes which shows uh, right where it's at. So it's about uh, extrapolation of, of real estate uh, uh, potential. Uh, there's no context in this image, which tells a lot. Uh, but there's some color. Uh, so, well, let's focus on the color here. Uh, this, this could be the interesting program in, in the whole new district. But it meant that the whole existing fabric should be uh, vanished. So, at that moment, we started to do thinking. We, after analysis, analyzing and, and, and writing about it, we really claimed that this is really going to kill the inner city. So, well, we, we became public architects at that moment. And we said, well, let's, let's show that these existing buildings have potential. So within three weeks' time, we opened up a, a gallery uh, on, the, on the corner of our block and just inviting a lot of people, organizing all kinds of events and uh, stimulating the idea that this existing fabric really could matter. So we even organized an, uh, a restaurant. Uh, we had no permission, but we just set up a dining club. Everybody could put a signature. And then it was a closed venue, so uh, we didn't need permission. Uh, for 10 days, we ran this restaurant there, and we proved that uh, it's a vital uh, building. Uh, but nevertheless, the elderman chose to, no, sorry, it's, it's, it looks really shitty, uh, we have to erase it. And we uh, noticed on most of those documents the word placemaking, although they don't know what it means, uh, neither do we, but at least we said, well, we can maybe check it out, what, what it means, test it on the, on the building. It will be uh, uh, torn down anyway, uh, so we can uh, test it. And maybe if it's successful, then finally, if this crisis is over in um, 20 years, uh, then the real estate speculation can go on on top of that. And you have a local trade center and a global trade center at, on, the, on the same time, going beyond the normal gentrification models. But of course, we had to start with the base. So we set up a business case. We uh, created a development company in which we had a, uh, uh, without subsidy and, and for five year business case, where the, the white was to be a public program which is afforded by the rental of, of office space. Uh, as real estate agents do, hanging posters all throughout the city asking, are you looking for space? It was 2008, uh, crisis was there, but there were obviously a lot of people looking for space. The, this gallery turned into an info center. We had great cappuccino and a nice model, and it attracted a lot of people. So we organized space dates. Uh, just dating and space, and uh, would you like to date with me in the space? And ultimately, <laughs> um, this led after a few months to new you know, small communities. People who started, to, oh, let's start an office, and well, they're still there. This ultimately led also with the elderman and the developer who was completely against in, in a half year long after protesting that, okay, we're opening up this city laboratory. And there it was after three months of, of uh, uh, renovation, it looked like this. So here uh, we, we claim also in, in, let's say, with a squatter history in Holland that these kind of vacant buildings are pu public uh, and could be, let's say, publicly owned private space to oppose uh, the other pubs. Um, uh, it became an entrance and address of 80 uh, companies from small to big. But this was ultimately the case to, to get people to get people there uh, uh, organized and uh, have them, well, uh, joining on the street. And But you see in this picture also the problem that uh, Robert Moses uh, kind of streetscape, which is really about getting from A to B and not to sit around, and people are really, okay, and now what? So we uh, thought, well, we, we need to have some furniture and what we could call the municipality, but it would at least take two years to get a bench or a tree there. So we set up our own factory around the corner. That building was empty anyway. And uh, with uh, the use of uh, reuse of material, it, two weeks later, we had our own first 
prototype of uh, urban furniture. On um, a parking spot, uh, so also without permission, it got a few parking tickets, and after these piled up, uh, then they, they didn't claim anymore that it was uh, illegal. But the whole point of this piece of wood on this parking lot was that did, this would happen. So uh, there were spontaneous street barbecues. So again, it is, uh, okay, a little bit of design, but the rest will uh, have to do with uh, uh, the entrepreneurs. So we analyzed this master plan, which was all about getting all these people which go out from Central Station to the inner city, but also through the Central District, but you can wonder where this confetti really goes to. Um, so again, uh, we start to analyze like we, we, we are uh, taught to do, like there's dead end streets everywhere around this roundabout. So how can we knit those things together and this um, infused the, the whole idea of maybe thinking of a kind of ring park, sort of Olmsted. Uh, Rotterdam style kind of big uh, necklace around the center of Rotterdam, but also creating a basic uh, yeah, notion here in the central district to connect it to the other uh, districts. Of course, it's megalomanian thoughts, so we had to set up an alternative alliance to, in order to well, get this thing done. And, um, and the whole point was here, let's move from the instant urbanism, which has been fashionable for the last 30 years, uh, erase everything, build a new skyscraper, and, and we're finished, to a permanent temporality. And it sounds easier than it is, of course. Uh, it starts with workshops with the owner, okay, maybe you can undo the model, undo all this foam, and see that there's actually a reality be beneath, uh, one to 500, and at the same time, on the street, uh, start painting zebras. And this is what we start to call the a test site, a one-to-one -one model, and um, it, it works like this. this is a, just a sketch after yesterday's discussion, is that we have an iterative process of testing and adapting on a high level with a long-term vision, but then going into the one-to-one -one and infusing ourselves with the knowledge we gain from what's happening on the street and how real users actually act. So this became the test site with um, 20 projects, so it's uh, like like uh, Mr. Kent yesterday said, you need 10 times 10, so it is 20, so maybe it's, he, he did have a point that uh, you need 20 things. Um, and these were all the strategies to to get certain projects going into uh, in this in this area. So we created alternatively a sort of strategic master plan, or let's not call it a master plan, but an, a vision, uh, which uh, connected all those districts which were disconnected for ages uh, exactly in the city center where uh, there used to be this lively heart of the city. Of course, uh, we had to go past this road. Uh, we needed finance and, well, there was, of course, no money. So um, we said, wow, well, why not start funding this and just build whatever we uh, can fund and, and just show how permanent temporality actually works, how financing works. And we started to uh, uh, divide the whole bridge in 17,000 wooden planks and simply started to sell them in, uh, and you could have your name on those planks. Probably you know this guy, uh, Alexander Washburn from the uh, department, uh, plank department in Manhattan who had an inspiring, inspiring lecture on the High Line. And just right afterwards we jumped on the stage, everybody was excited and we said, well, we're not, New York, it's just Rotterdam, and we don't have 100 billion uh, which can go into this project. So maybe you can start uh, handing over 25 euros. So thank you, New York, for buying the first uh, <laughs> plank. It's over there. And our elderman also bought the second plank. So it was the first 50 guilders or euros for the bridge. And afterwards, the crowdfunding engine we, we designed uh, uh, really uh, hit uh, the 150,000 euros uh, in three months. And that uh, made us possible to Im start to imagine this new connectivity, this new kind of public space, which is not just a bridge, um, but uh, um, really a, a, an, uh, an urban space. And even the, the derelict backside, the, 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 the vacant lots with these empty buildings, there, I didn't mention it, but there was 100,000 square meters of empty office space around to re-engage this uh, with uh, new types of users. And also roofscapes could be imagined as, as more uh, communal spaces. 
something happened that uh, the municipality started a city initiative grant for the best city initiative in which they said a uh, hundred uh, percent of our total budget will be given to the best city initiative we were selected as one of the five it was four million euros to be uh, uh, given away so we had to start campaigning we had to convince 600,000 Rotterdam inhabitants that this plan we had was a good plan. So we really had to go on the street, uh, organize ourselves with ambassadors and uh, going into the neighborhoods, uh, really harassing people from their bikes. Uh, the, the, the gallery became a polling station. Uh, well, there were some quite dangerous situations uh, appearing, but at least we could make clear that uh, this um, is this my wife uh, and partner, uh, sort of Jane Jacobs reincarnation. Uh, <laughs> um, but th this really made it very public. You know, it was very naked to, to tell in this way. So the whole building became one advert. Even the, the commercial advert said, well, we can, well, we can lend you for two weeks this sign and uh, you can have your uh, sign for your Luchtsingel in there. Well, this went way beyond our comfort zone as uh, professional designers, <laughs> but we went into the nights, into the clubs, and did these flash mobs and shouted, uh, vote for the Luchtsingel. It, well, ultimately, it, uh, it, it worked. 48% uh, of the votings were for our plan, so in this uh, little envelope was 4 million euros. Um, uh, that brought us also to the possibility to really start executing parts of this plan. Of course, we already had our own funding, so the next morning at 7.30, the first piece of bridge was delivered and uh, situated right uh, against the building. It doesn't make any sense. It's going from nowhere to nowhere. It's simply a mock-up. And it was there for a few weeks, and people wondering, OK, is this the whole project? And <laughs> But people start gossiping about it and, and what's happening. We start really... Uh, extensively uh, adding zebras. We convinced the owner that uh, this demolition budget could already be spent on a, a very a nice and small passage through the buildings so to get the confetti already going. And what happened then is that people who would never be in this backside uh, certain, uh, uh, at a certain moment really entered and wh where am I? And you see the, the connection with the, the, the surrounding is not yet there totally. Uh, but it, it slowly started to revive. And most important thing is that those entrepreneurs um, really uh, well started to activate this, this derelict public space, even a beer garden, and worked really well. Uh, it was the most sunny place. You can make a lot of noise there. Um, and in only one night uh, in, in, Ju in July, we passed over the main road with this bridge. Uh, celebrating that the north neighborhood and the center neighborhood finally could connect. Uh, this was the first 100 meters of the ultimately 350 meters bridge. And this was a, a serious moment where the public space really uh, injected into the private spaces. So this is really where it went through the building. It's an ultimate publicized private space. And, and, and really, we are still not contractually sure what it is. Um, and then that's interesting. Um, and here you see how, how it lands then, and also these are all our co-crowd funders. We have uh, already 5,000 of them, and each having their own message. Uh, even on the roof, it was vacant anyway. Uh, we started uh, to have some crops there, 1,000 square meters, in the midst of the center, really uh, also performing. And uh, in the, ultimately, in the plinth, we made a deal with the GSD, and uh, our neighbor, uh, Mr. Kohlhaas, that uh, he could have his uh, exhibition there, uh, the elements of architecture, but he had to throw out a public event for free, uh, again, to uh, create new public, create new audience for this uh, area. So uh, fully crowded, um, well, former vacant office space now really became a big venue. And ultimately, all these strategies of connecting, transforming, adding um, uh, and reviving public space played into uh, something which is now, well, uh, retrospectively to be analyzed how it really works. And we don't know uh, exactly how it works, but this is uh, the, the sequence of projects which are now popping out and also a lot of new initiatives coming in. But we try to uh, not design it too much, uh, but uh, of course we, uh, well, there's a big task for us, a responsibility to spend the money well. Here you see 
uh, how the three neighborhoods will connect by uh, a big roundabout in New uh, Urban Park, where there will be a boxing school, uh, urban farming uh, playgrounds, all inf uh, um, informed by the, by the local users. And this will be the ultimate uh, hollow core where once there was this uh, city center. So for me, for, it's uh, important for discussion, like can informality become formalized and uh, can temporality be a permanent condition? And uh, well, there's, I want to conclude this lecture not without the commercial break that um, you can visit uh, the, the real stuff. And uh, we also would like you to um, still comp contribute to uh, build this bridge. Thank you. Okay, so this guy's Jim Carvel, right? A lot of you guys know him. Um, he became famous for, among other things, giving a somewhat crassly worded piece of advice to aspiring President Bill Clinton that sat on his desk as a reminder. So I am presumptuously going to cast myself as the Jim Carvel to um, you all, uh, President Clinton, as the makers, definers, planners of public spaces and vital urban environments with this invective. Um, I find myself very surprised to um, feel like when I distill down what it is that I have said here over the last, you know, eight months or so, um, that it is this, <laughs> that I have to say it um, over and over again on some level. But it, it, but it needs to be said. It is the human beings. And not that I think any of you are stupid, but much to the contrary. In fact, I think you're brilliant, um, the mass of you. Um, but, um, but it's an important thing and I find myself returning to it uh, very often. I'm Jim Lasko, and that's my email address. You're welcome to contact me about anything that you find offensive, including that last thing, um, or otherwise. Um, this is my city. This is the city of Chicago. And uh, I choose this slide in part because um, I actually just pulled it out of a video that I love that sh that's a time lapse. Um, video that it, it really demonstrates the meat and heart of the city, that kind of pulsing vitality, that uh, muscle and poetry that represents this great machine that we've developed that works. That's our motto in Chicago, the city that works, the city that um, has a heartbeat of its own. And um, But you know what happens when we develop machines that have their own heartbeat? They come back to um, hunt us down and kill us, or to slowly manipulate us and then kill us. Um, and they hunt us down and kill us, or slowly manipulate us and kill us. And in the end, of course, it's um, human beings that will save us. I, I, I get it. I mean, I get that other people are hell. I get that we, um, we love our, I too love my forms and my plans and my systems. Um, and I get that human beings mess them up. Um, terribly, again and again, their endless hunger, their need, their desperation, their insecurity, I, I, I get all that. But in the end, it will be, um, human beings will be our salvation, I'm sure of it. Um, and, and I can't really imagine thinking differently. After all, it's, um, um, oh, sorry, I wanted to show you this, because I know that also, you know, this is not a viable solution. Um, <laughs> But in the end, when it gets terrible and we really feel like we are on the precipice of disaster and it looks like the machines will win and it looks like we can't find another way out, it is these simple, heroic human acts, these dynamic, ultra-human acts that will save us. Um, it was, after all, um, Neo was dead and Trinity came and kissed him in a gesture of faith and love and it brought him back to life and he saw the world as it really was and he stopped bullets and he saved humanity. And I believe it actually. By the way, these are cultural references. Um, th these, are, these are movies. Um, they're like, they're, you can think of them as cultural artifacts. They're like books and sculpture and stuff. Um, 
So, um, but I believe this. I believe that our humanity will be our savior. And I can't really think that anybody could think differently. Our ability to um, take on the challenges that are presenting themselves more and more forcefully every day will not be our ability to invent new forms or our ability to write great things or say great things in this room, but it will be instead our ability to connect to those people who um, seem most unfamiliar and who, uh, 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 with whom we appear to have the least in common. Um, so that, was, that is what my work was about. And my work really started in the theater, which is where I thought I had the most um, opportunity to create the possibility for this real connection. And I was working with objects as a kind of third object that sat between the audience and the uh, art maker as a way of, of creating a participatory relationship, a sort of uh, what Jacques Ranciere would call a third object. And so we began to make these shows. This was a, an adaptation of Moby Dick. And, this was a, a production, actually, of um, The Hunchback of Notre Dame that toured um, the country and ended up in an off-Broadway house in, in New York. And this was an adaptation of the um, d cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And uh, that's an adaptation of Cyrano. And th these works were um, really quite gratifying to make. Um, and, I, and I loved making them. And I loved the theater space. But I uh, realized at a certain point that I, I didn't believe in the theater space, that um, the theater space had so many layers of convention between um, it and its audience that, that, um, that it, was, it felt impossible to really make uh, the deep connection that I wanted to make. And more importantly, I would felt that I was speaking to a very narrow band of the public, of course, that I'm speaking to people who can and want to pay 40, 60, 80 dollars a ticket, and that that uh, was a pretty small self-selecting group of people. And so I began to um, bring that work out into public spaces and conceive of um, the public space as not only the venue, but the material, the actual uh, 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 form itself, that the human interactivity and the public space were the uh, media. Um, that public spaces are the symbolic heart of a city, and that actions taken there and uh, the ways that they can demonstrate our humanity and the possibility of connection seemed um, vitally important to me. This is Ping Tom Park. It's a park on the um, southwest side of Chicago. It sits between Pilsen and Chinatown. It's in uh, a manufacturing belt there. It's in somewhat contested territory. And um, this, um, the fact that there are no people in this picture or in this one or in any of the following is um, testament not so much to photographer preference, but I think actually the way that the, the park was um, being related to at the time, though, you know, of course, um, photographers don't like people either, really. Um, <laughs> not in their public spaces at any rate. Oh no, a person stopped. Um, and and um, so we created a show for this park. And uh, I'm just going to delve into the narrative just because I thought at this point in the day it'd be fun to do that um, for hopefully for you all. So this is the boss man. And the boss man was an aspiring um, uh, uh, mayor in a, in a small town with great ambition and great heart and passion. And this is his first date with Au, and they're having a, um, a wonderful roasted chicken picnic dinner. And um, here, Au is about to write onto the balloon her phone number at the end of their date, and they're going to part. And they're, they're stopping, by the way, to wave to um, the L train that's passing. Because we sat in the crux of uh, an L train, a freight line, the traffic along the river, a commuter line, um, and a, uh, an Amtrak line, and street traffic, we devised into the show a series of ways to um, acknowledge the interruptions of the traffic that were there. And the way to acknowledge the interruption of the L was that all the performers stopped whatever they were doing, no matter what action it was, and just turned and waved at the train, like this kind of passing, you know, this this hopeful wave of a child at the at the train conductor, like full of the fruitless desire to connect. And then they would just jump right back into the drama. So this is what's happening in these pictures. So in in the next scene, um, 
As the boss man tries to call Au on, on the phone, he fumbles and loses hold of the balloon, and we see it floating away into the sky, the only way that he has to um, reach this great love of his that he just found. And of course, this um, breaks his heart. And uh, like a lot of men, he um, channels that into aggression and uh, ambition. And so he orders his right-hand man, uh, Mr. Hay, to, to tax the people. Um, so Mr. Hay is here preparing for a census. Um, and he'll go out into the um, people and tax them with roasted chickens that are served um, from this cart that roved around all night and um, served roasted chicken to the people who were um, there in the park. Um, and uh, here he is eating his roasted chicken up in his house. And you can see there the central pivot point of this kind of precarious tower. But he wanted to live as high um, as he could possibly above his population. And here he is again, you know, eating more chicken. And, uh, but one day a crooner um, shows up in town, and he, a uh, traveling crooner, and he's singing his songs. And who is his most devoted, uh, loyal fan? It's Au. And uh, the boss man is, is uh, uh, driven to uh, um, insane excess in trying to win Au back. And in fact, what is about to unfold is the most absurd section of the play. But we worked with the um, Chicago Gay um, um, Windy City Choir, and they, um, he hires them. So he hires them, and they all come running in and sing a song to try to win Au's heart over. And it's a kind of battle of the bands between um, the Windy City Gay Men's Choir and the and and um, the crooner and the crooner eventually wins not because he it turns out is a better singer by any means but because he's cute and the men are prone to that and also because the narrative needed that to be the case and um, so he wins and this drives the mayor to a kind of psychotic rage and he, he threatens to shoot everybody including himself and eventually decides not to but just as he's pulling the gun away he inadvertently accidentally shoots um, the only innocent in the play and the house breaks and it begins to tip back and forth and um, throw itself up and down and, the, and, it, and it has to be righted by um, by the choir, but also by audience members, by anybody, and so they write the um, the house, and the mayor comes, and and he comes down, and he's gained a lot of weight because he's been eating. <laughs> a lot of chicken up there. And so he runs over to try to save the man, but he fails. And he, um, he, he spares no expense, however, in throwing a very lavish and extravagant funeral that comes down the Chicago River that includes fire and chimes and uh, lanterns and, um, and, and goes under that elevator bridge that I pointed out earlier um, there. So that's the show. But that's not the show, because um, the show really was um, much more. It was about the experience. And the experience of the, uh, because the, the, the thing that I realized is it's not, it, narrative is this uh, uh, omnipresent cultural force that's happening all the time, that we are being thrown narratives constantly. Um, I, I, re I read this interview by this guy, an advertising guy, who said, we cracked the narrative the same way that we, one time we cracked the atom. We have now cracked the narrative. And we can deploy, sorry, we can deploy its component parts in any which way in one minute segments and 30 second segments in order to um, do what we want. And so the narrative wasn't the thing. The thing was the experience. Because in fact, we're in this place where we um, have occluded one eye. This is a famous um, neurological study where these kittens were poor kittens, sorry, um, where um, one eye was stitched shut. And then they studied their neural activity. And they found that 85% of the neural activity um, rerouted itself to the other eye, um, amazingly adaptive. Um, what was interesting, though, is that when they opened the occluded eye, they found that almost none of the activity rerouted itself back to that other eye. And here's another interesting study where, uh, very famous, you guys probably know it, but where these monkeys were given the opportunity to, um, were given a choice of two synthetic mothers. One was made out of cloth and one was made out of wire. And um, the, the monkeys preferred the cloth one, not surprising. It was um, sensorily sim stimulating and it was, um, but what was surprising was that they preferred the cloth one even when their sustenance 
in the form of milk from a bottle, came from the wire one. Um, so this was interesting, and I thought, you know, this is really what's happened, right? We've occluded one eye, um, and we are beginning to uh, search for um, our stimulus that we need, this connection that we need from um, the, the place that we have sought all of our stimulus for so long. We are in our phones, and so we are watching as our public spaces are being defied by and reshaped by the private experiences of phones and pads while we re-hit, refresh again and again to make some kind of connection, even though the people are right there. Right, they're there, and again and again they're there. So that even the uh, most um, um, these activities that seem most ideally suited to communal activity are now sources of communal isolation instead. And so um, the experience, the experience that was created was really. So I'm trying to open the other eye. Sorry. That was a, that's what that is for. Um, and I'm trying specifically to figure out ways to reduce fear and increase care. How can we bring people together? We have to reduce fe fe fear and increase care. And um, so the experience was when you arrived at the park, a park that nobody went to, there were characters already in motion all over. And they were um, trying to promote interaction between audience members, between themselves, and with other people. And, um, and then they kind of slowly arrived and centered around the, the, in the center of the park for the, the, most of the drama. And we then watched the drama unfold. And um, the experience, again, was in, in one moment, the, the, the performers turned for their wave at the passing train. And they looked. And in the train windows, somebody had pasted cardboard hands waving back. <laughs> The experience was that when the funeral happened, the characters walked to the river's edge and you sort of went there with them. And in that moment, you transformed yourself from spectator to participant. You went from being somebody who was watching all of this action to somebody who was collaborating in the creation of this fictive environment. That was the experience. The experience was that on the first night we did this show, there were 1,000 people. And on the last night we did the show, there were 5,000 people. And if you can't tell, those are people on the left side. Um, and you know that compared to that. Um, so we began to make these works and work in a whole bunch of different ways so that this was a, um, a piece installed in the Olmsted Jackson Park Lagoons, the one-time site in the 1893 World's Fair, um, but a completely neglected area um, now. Um, this was, this is actually the facade of the Museum of Contemporary Art where we inverted and challenged the austerity of that plaza by bringing people into the um, plaza to watch a show as it unfolded into the windows through thousands of tiny hand illustrated images and a series of overhead projectors and volunteer performers and volunteers um, all around. And we created this one big giant funny weird uh, comic book, projected comic book. And this is what I've been working on most recently, which is creating these um, uh, mo vehicles that can create absence, that can kind of push into a public space, create pre presence in a very vital, immediate, and somewhat dangerous way, and then leave. And by leaving, create a sense of absence and an invitation to action. And so that's what these last two vehicles are about here. And they, of course, have tricks, because exploding toilets are funny. <laughs> and fire. Um, and this is the next big project. The next big project for me is that I have been, Red Moon Theater has been commissioned to uh, create a signature event for the city of Chicago. And so we're hoping to um, create uh, an event around the Great Chicago Fire, that the festival will start in neighborhoods, um, with uh, um, projects, art, uh, art, artists and residents working with neighbors, uh, community members in order to create pictures of what their community might look like if they were to rebuild it. Who and how would they rebuild their neighborhoods? And how would they bring all of that together um, into an image? And then that image will be encased in um, this uh, lantern fabric um, that is actually um, 
the Chicago's the name of the smelly onion, the, the Indian name means smelly onion. So these are smelly onions that, that will then float down the river and then uh, in the final gesture burn. And as they burn, they will crack open to reveal this vision of the future. So in summary, um, is human being stupid? Public spaces are the symbolic heart of the city. Reduce fear, increase care. I'm Jim Lasco. thank you. So is the presentation up or? I don't know why there's a sticky note there. Uh, is, it, is there a way to take that off? <laughs> uh, so, um, so I'm happy to, I'll just, I guess we'll just go with it there. Oh, there it goes, great. Um, so I'm happy to uh, have been uh, invited to participate in this important dialogue on tangible uh, public space. And I think as we've been talking about so far and as we've heard today, uh, public space comes in many forms. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk about uh, temporary public space, an open space conceived of, designed by, and installed by the users of that space, a do-it-yourself effort, although one framed and encouraged and somewhat managed by the city as a city employee, uh, to create programming along our streets. I'll call this DIYG, or do-it-yourself with government. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, specifically San Francisco's Pavement to Parks program, its plazas, but in greater detail, its parklets. So today I'll give a, uh, a brief overview of the, of the program itself, how it started, why it started, the need it was trying to address. I'll show some examples of some of the projects that we have on the ground, and I'll uh, explore whether in the long run these spaces matter at all, uh, what staying power they, these temporary spaces have in our cities. So the Payment to Parks program formally began in 2008 in direct response to uh, the DOT commissioner from New York, Jeanette Sadat Khan, who was visiting San Francisco for a conference. Uh, New York City had installed a number of their temporary plazas by that point, and she challenged our mayor to do the same. But San Francisco already had a history of temporary interventions, started three years earlier by the design group Rebar, parking day, uh, which was one day a year where pop-up green spaces, living rooms, picnic areas, took over the parking lane for just hours at a time, had already become a, a citywide and somewhat international phenomenon. By 2008, on that one day of the year, at least 15 temporary parking day installations could be seen on the streets of San Francisco. So the Pavement to Parks program was born by these two challenges. How could we as a city harness the public's creative capital to create temporary spaces as truly public spaces that were dynamic, replicable, and lasting? So probably not too dissimilar from other urbanized cities, fully one quarter of San Francisco's land mass is streets. And uh, like other American cities, these streets are generally designed for transportation, not as spaces that foster community. So looking back at a snapshot, a snapshot of 2005 when Parking Day first began, San Francisco for decades had been going in the opposite direction, removing pretty much all public seating from our streets. The, pu the public realm along our streets was sterile, largely in response to social, con social concerns, and aside from a few planners and designers tucked away in various departments, there really wasn't any city-led initiative to start thinking in a new way. On many streets, for example, you could walk the entire corridor without finding a single place to sit down, unless, of course, you were willing to buy a sandwich or a cup of coffee at a cafe. But outside of the city government family, there was a strong desire by advocates, neighborhood leaders, civic sponsors to re-envision the public realm. So then the notion of temporary as a catalyst started to emerge. We could actually do something, not invest a lot of money, which is important given budgets at the time, and see if it worked. There wasn't the same commitment. If it didn't work, it could go away. If the spaces were not a positive addition, they could go away. New York City showed us how to do this as a government effort, and our own parking day showed us how to do this with government acquiescence. Our program would merge these two strategies. And so the Pavement to Parks program was born. I had been working on street design, and when I was asked by the mayor to create a new program in line with what New York City was doing at the time, <clears throat> I wasn't given any money, 
there really wasn't any, but could use city staff and any surplus materials in the city's various storage yards. So the initial model we created for our plazas was one, to ignore as much as possible the standard approval paths. It was two, partner with the local designer to work with the community to develop a plan. And then three, allow the space itself to be the planning exercise. So the, space, the idea, as we've heard earlier today, was that these spaces could be iterative, that phased implementation could occur over time, and that the users of the space could define its future. So the Castro, just as a, as a simple, a, a single example here, our first plaza has gone through three different iterations, each building off of the previous. Cardboard planters have become concrete. The seating areas have moved, the landscaping has changed, and now the town square, as people call it, is getting ready for its next phase. And these iterative improvements have been driven by the users of the space. People aren't shy with their words, and definitely not with their actions. Making responsive improvements was just a matter of observation. <clears throat> the city has only enabled this to happen. The ideas for change, the change itself, has been driven by the space's stakeholders. And then starting in, in 2010, the Pavement to Parks program branched out, aiming to bring the goals of the program to neighborhoods across the city. And hence, the notion of the parklet was born. The parklet is a, is a semi-temporary extension of the sidewalk bringing it out roughly to the outside edge of the parking lane and extending in most cases one, two, or three parking spaces in length. Although one example in our downtown uh, neighborhood extends for two complete city blocks. These spaces are generally between, you know, they're very small, so between 120 square feet and 350 square feet, and they float over the street and its infrastructure, drainage, curbs, and subsurface utilities remain unaltered. With this new design expression, my goal was to act more than ever as an enabler, to guide and advise, and to shepherd the proposals through any unexpected agency and concern. But ultimately, the existence of the space depended on an end user, a sponsor, someone other than the city. I'll come back to this in a, in a moment. So I made a, deci a conscious decision early on that we weren't going to standardize the design, although it would have made it much easier, of course, for us to do so. Instead, we would set simple design parameters aimed at ensuring that the space felt public, that it was safely situated and it responded to the needs of the street. And with that, we left it up to individuals, on the ground sponsors, to propose locations and to work with the designer and their neighbors to articulate a design proposal. <clears throat> with that, the city merely reviewed and provided design commentary, issuing permits for those projects that fit the established criteria. Here, this is one of our parklets in the Mission District, and it acts as sort of a, as a mobile art installation. So every quarter, a new piece of mobile art uh, finds itself on the, on the parklet. So these are temporary spaces that celebrate the fact that they are, in fact, temporary. They're movable. Uh, one was actually put up for sale on Craigslist a few months ago. Uh, their configuration can and often does change. They can go from offering seating to providing uh, space for kids to draw. One of them has sort of a setup of chalkboards, and they or to provide space to park a bike. So some have questioned whether the notion of temporary space has staying power, whether spaces like parklets are a good thing, a positive addition to the public space lexicon, or if they are just a fad responding to conditions today that may not exist tomorrow. While I cannot answer that question definitively, I think that there are two things to consider here. The first response to the parklets them, park themselves. The city now has 32 of them on the ground, and there are 180 in the approval pipeline. Individual projects have come and gone, and some projects have been iteratively redesigned. The interest more than three years after we first began is, is really overwhelming. They have a life of their own. Now cities across the country are emulating the program, LA, Oakland, New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago, and as I hear, hopefully this summer here in Boston. I think that for the foreseeable future, parklets will continue uh, to be a valuable response to the desire to provide an urban public space that is deeply integrated with the street fabric. And this is important given that so much of our cities are streets. Second, I think that one of the most valuable additions to the conversation we're here today to talk about, physical, real, public space, what I think will be the lasting legacy of this program, 
is not only that the, is not only the open space itself, but also how a program such as this has enabled people outside of city government to make real, lasting improvements to the public realm. The Pavement to Parks program re-envisioned how temporary spaces and the not so temporary are encouraged and authorized. The presumption now, of course, is that they should. And the role of the bureaucrat is to find a way to make it happen. This isn't the way it always was. One, someone in, in my position could always find out, come up with a reason why not to do something. So this iterative testing model of tactical urbanism, in my opinion, has a real and lasting place in our work. And back to the model for a quick moment, plazas and parklets rely on an on-the-ground partner, a sponsor for parklets. Uh, for parklets, the sponsor is responsible for choosing the location, working on securing community stakeholder support, working with their neighbors and their constituents on a design. And then finally, after getting a permit, installing the parklet on the ground and maintaining it once it's there. And for some, providing programming on, its, uh, on, its, on the parklet itself. So this one here, also in the mission, was the site of a, a wedding uh, last summer. So a fair question to ask is whether this is in some way, you know, this notion of sponsorship is in some way ceding the public realm to some semi-private use. That inherent in the management responsibility of the parklet, the sponsor exerts some level of private influence over that space. I think I, I can respond with the following. Um, I think since these spaces are public spaces, they are required by regulation to be publicly accessible to all at all times. Uh, to, in, uh, to enhance the visual aesthetics of the street and to encourage activity on the street. When you consider what the alternative is, the storage of the private automobile, the park is, parklet is imminently more public. Having the sponsor ensures that the space remains viable and welcoming space for everyone in a way that the city never could do. And in reflection as a city employee, I developed a process that empowered the community to make improvements improvements that would have otherwise likely been rejected by the city. So in other words, my job for the city was to help people get around the city. This program was sanctioned by our mayor and in such acted kind of like an express lane bypassing the normal bureaucracy. There were many others of, like, like me who wanted uh, something similar and saw the implications of this temporary model beyond the pavement to parks program. And many of our department directors were behind the program as well. But under normal circumstances, even with this, the system itself uh, was set up, uh, the system that we had in place was set up to make temporary improvements nearly impossible. This program changed that. I was told, for example, early on that I would need to take every single project through the standard engineering review path with the utilities, the fire department, the police, transit engineers, et cetera. And my simple response was that I would not, and I didn't. Um, and now, as a result of that, the model is being used for typologies beyond plazas and parklets. It's being used for transportation tests, for alley improvements, for mobile food pods, and, and much more. So pavement to parks now means, at least for us back in San Francisco, empowering the public to make public space work better for the public, and in a quick, deliberate way. Failure of a particular space may happen, and that's okay, because it's part of the learning process. Parklets are a new open space typology inserted into the fabric of the street, and as such, offer something that other open spaces cannot. The most immediate and logical comparison would be to a sidewalk widening or a mid-block bulb out. But these more traditional public realm improvements can never reflect the same level of design creativity, of individuality, which I think makes these parklets so interesting. A street provides a transportation conduit. A sidewalk provides space for all the people-oriented uses that create neighborhoods. Parks are more formal open spaces that exist with, but apart from, the street realm. Parklets occupy a space in the middle. And as temporary, I think that they're better able to respond to the changing demands that exist to the parking lane. And hence, I'd pose they're not a second best solution. Parks and traditional plazas offer a different experience and cannot reflect that dynamism. The interaction with the movement on the street, people, bikes, transit, and cars, that frenetic energy makes the parklets something different. 
Part of the success of the program is that it's an initiative that has emerged and has been fostered by our community stakeholders. Parklets are designed entirely by designers working for on the ground neighborhood sponsors, not by the city. The city provides a guidance, a green light per se. The result is something that is imminently more creative design wise, and I think ultimately better embraced by the neighborhood as a result. So just briefly, I think that, you know, this is, it's been a, an interesting last five years with this program. Um, and I think that there's, you know, we just had an open house uh, last, week, uh, last week where we sort of invited new people to apply for the program and we had 150 different entities that were interested in applying. So the interest is really out there and, and sort of seeing it, this spread to other cities has been a, a, a great thing. Thank you. Sure. Uh, okay, so I think we have some new, um, some new adjectives to add to our, our list of adjectives that describe this panel. Entrepreneurial, uh, interdisciplinary, theatrical, resourceful, and I think most, most interestingly, local. Something I want to come back to, but before that, I want to turn it over to the audience. Remember, if, uh, if, so raise your hand um, and uh, identify yourself, and if you have a particular person who you want to address your question, please mention that. Uh, and with that, I open the floor. Yes. Um, my name is Deborah Burns. I'm wait. Oh wait, wait for the, also wait for the mic. Okay. <laughs> my name is Deborah Burns. I'm not an urban planner, but I uh, work on cities in various ways um, from a retail perspective. Um, first, I just want to say all of you, <coughs> unbelievable, fantastic, amazing, personal, inspiring. I'm blown away. I'm blown away by each example that you showed, and it was just spectacular, each of you, and amazing. So thank you. I'm very, very inspired um, to see what you each have done so differently and so fantastically. That's one. Um, my question is... And forgive me, Mr. Pavement Parks. <laughs> That's right. Um, one of the things that happens with retail and um, districts, not necessarily neighborhoods, is that we, you know, we built four-lane highways, which is particularly true in Boston, in the Seaport District. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. And and the challenge of trying to bring people besides doing the restaurant thing, um, to the street so that the street feels more like a place is something that, is this something that you think the pavement to parks movement can help with? Because, you know, we have four lane highways where nobody's gonna walk over them and nobody's gonna Used the district that district because it was designed with a different concept in mind. That's my question. So um, there were in San Francisco has the you know like a, every other American city has a similar street grid. You know we have are plenty of our uh, multi-lane arterials. Um, on you know generally speaking, the the parklets I think. The, at least the initial round tended to be on, on streets that had no more than a, a single lane of traffic in each direction. Although about sort of, sort of in this, our second round of projects, we actually focused on, on the larger streets. And we sort of looked at it in two ways. One, on those streets that were larger, we tried to work with our transportation engineers to do a four to three conversion. So basically taking four lanes down to one lane in each direction with a, a center lane as a trial. And then with those, we, we put out some parklets to really see sort of how the dynamic of the street could change. Again, all of that's reversible if it didn't work. If it caused Armageddon from a traffic engineer's perspective, it could be reversed. Um, but I think ultimately the design, they can be designed to, to deal with the conditions of the street. So on, on, in locations where you have more thoroughfare, more, more volume, more speed, the design just needs to res respond to that and you can still create a space that's inviting for people. 
but again, the design has to be contextual and, and, and reflective of, of the condition. Other questions? Oh, I, I got a microphone. Oh. <laughs> um, my name's Tim Sorinsky. <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm a planning student here at Harvard. Um, my instinct is that the um, one of the selling points for temporary reality and informality and DIY um, from a government perspective is as this sort of bridge from either disuse to use or as a bridge towards sort of brick and mortar development, you know, the food truck that becomes a sit down restaurant, the vacant lot that becomes a park. Um, my question, I guess, to everybody is, um, do you see the, the possibilities and the virtues um, fr from a city government perspective um, for an embrace of informality and, and sort of DIY development um, for its own sake, you know, as a deliberate sort of policy as opposed to this sort of bridge? Um, I think that uh, in, in, in our case that uh, by demonstrating that other ways of organizing, financing, getting things done um, helped us, but also the, the government to see its own role in a different perspective. Uh, so far, Rotterdam was used since the war just to have this whole machinery of planners, uh, well, get to work. And uh, un until the, the last uh, square centimeter of the pedestrian area. And, and now through well, this process, which uh, was unprecedented in, in this scale, um, they, they, they are now really tending towards uh, a government which is more facilitating with um, laws which are more adapt adaptive, policies which are more adaptive, and also the, um, they would go out more out of their desks and their environments and just, well, like uh, San Francisco is also proving is getting a lot of knowledge, street, street knowledge, facts on the ground uh, into this process. And I think that's, that's the main, uh, well, fringe of in this era we are in, is that this, there's, there's a more interdisciplinary but also uh, collective work to make these things work. Does anyone else want to take that one? Is there a temporary for temporary sake? I, I, I would just sort of say, well, I'm very glad all of a sudden here, um, that I think it sort of goes both ways. I think that there are, I mean, when we originally envisioned the Parklet program, the, design, the intent, at least from the government side, was a way to demonstrate the need for wider sidewalks. But now on some of the streets that have parklets and there actually has, monies have been identified to do the more traditional capital project, the widening of the sidewalk, People are saying, well, what about the parklets? And the parklets would have to go away because there wouldn't be room for them anymore. So I think from that perspective, there is that desire. And also, and I think that carries true with some of our, the, the plaza spaces as well. Originally, they were intended to be a demonstration and sort of to be an iterative sort of expression until we got to the permanent. And the Castro Plaza, which I showed here, people don't want it to become permanent. They want it to change every year, year and a half. And so, you know, I think we've learned that there actually is this desire for the temporary, you know, the space being a permanent temporary space. I, mean, I think that the, the temporary is a um, is the antidote to the permanent. You know, it's not it's not a valorization of the permanent. The temporary aspires to be permanent, and one day will achieve it. But it's actually that the temporary has a, a whole different set of virtues. And, and for me, as a, as a pr practitioner, th that's about disruption. That's about its capacity to interrupt habit, to, um, to challenge the structures that are in place and all of the implicit ideologies of those structures and to uh, create the opportunity for people to reconfigure those ideologies. And I think that's, that's the virtue of the temporary for me. Great. Other questions? Um, OK. One. Two, three. Hi, my name's Lydia. I'm from the Graduate School of Education. And it seems like there are a lot of informal learning opportunities inherent in these different uh, sites and models for public engagement. And I'm wondering, for all three of you, um, if you think there's room to make education a more explicit component of these projects, and in particular for young people. Well, um to respond, uh, we, I showed this very quickly. The, the alternative alliance we set up to start this thing going was um, uh, partly also a lot of youngsters involved. 
Uh, we have we had ten different universities, but also smaller high schools involved. It maybe started with a timber workshop to how to make your own bench, um, that kind of thing. Uh, but later on, uh, when we are uh, will execute the park, we all, there's a lot of schools around. They will have to partly uh, install the park, so it's also theirs. So it's um, uh, education. I don't know. It's it's more citizenship starting from your early age that you know as a citizen that you have to be part of making city and therefore uh, being the city. And um, so yeah. For me, that last point is the thing. I mean, I, I think what we're providing, and, and I didn't say it, but in each of these projects that we do, we have uh, many different varying degrees and means of community participation. So, but what, you know, the untold part of the kitten, the occluded eye story of the kitten is that the, when the kittens were young enough and the eye was reopened, they readapted that neural activity over to the other eye. So it is, in, in a sense, you know, at least our best opportunity appears to be to provide um, youth with the opportunity to occupy space differently than how we think they, uh, how they currently think they should occupy space and how they can commit, create connections. So we do that. That's built into our process at, at every level. And also, I would, just, I would just add a tiny thing. So I think the spaces that we put on the ground in a very, in a somewhat sort of secondary, passive way, are themselves an you know, a piece of education about sort of really sort of showing that the streets can be something more than just a place to move and, and park cars. Um, but in a more direct way, we we work very closely with the school district in San Francisco, and we plug students in with the projects that are being built in the, in the areas around the schools and. So it becomes sort of this really valuable exercise of going through sort of design build. So it's like, you know, the, the public participatory process to sort of get consensus around a project, putting the design together, and then actually going out and building it. So we have, we work very closely with the schools to do that. Hi, um, my name is Vonda Lieberman. I'm here at the GSD. And my question is actually for Andres. And we worked together in the past under very different circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, although it actually applies to public space, these initiatives and other public spaces too. Um, I think this Parklet program, which has emerged since I left San Francisco, and it seems it's wonderful, both the designs look wonderful, but also um, the procedures and the, um, the different uh, processes and relationships that they produce. Um, but I'm curious about something that I know is a big issue in San Francisco, which is homelessness, and that's a form of um, I guess, public-private mixing that has been regulated as illegitimate. And I'm wondering how that's dealt with and whether that's welcomed or if there are prohibitions for those kinds of practices. And I guess that applies to situations in Chicago and Rotterdam as well, perhaps. But I know San Francisco much better. I mean, that was one of, it would, that was probably the second when we were trying to pull together the program to sort of create new temporary spaces on the street. That was after sort of creating sort of a, you know traffic Armageddon. The next point that was brought up was you know was social concerns, homelessness, because that is a, a pervasive issue in San Francisco, and it's why every single public you know every street has been essentially sterilized. Um, you know, I it really hasn't. So there is no prohibition; they're completely public, so anyone can use them. There, are, you know, um, so if you're homeless, you're welcome to use these spaces. If you're not homeless you're welcome to use them as well. Um, generally, I think because the spaces are so well activated, that because they're, they have sort of that physical connection to sort of, a, sort of a retail frontage or to the activity along a street, so there's that intimate connection with movement in the city, that sort of that homelessness issue hasn't materialized in the same way that it does in some of in our parks, for example, where they're, there's, they're, they're isolated spaces, there's sort of, you know, there's a disconnect between sort of the, the vibrancy of the city. And so yes, I mean like every space, some of them have problems, but the vast majority of them, and even in those that do have problems, it isn't something that makes the space at the end of the day sort of unusable by people. People, you know, it seems to have worked itself out. It's a balance that was a test and, you know, you know, it's, it's a difficult topic. It's something that sort of, that is part of every single discussion that we have in San Francisco, both on open space and otherwise, um, but you know, at this point, it really it's it's worked. The balance has been has been has landed in the right direction. 
one more on this side, and then I promise I'll get to this side of the room. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Dorota Kamrowska Zawuska from Gdańsk University of Technology and recently Spurs Fellow in MIT. I'd like to uh, ask you uh, what do you think about the relation between the uh, uh, community participation in the design f uh, phase and the uh, um, uh, then the flexibility of this of the use of the space later is it a correlation or you, this is negative correlation because if the people uh, um, people who live there know what their needs they would like to make the space permanently to their needs or would they be, feel that it should be temporarily flexible I think that's, that's a very relevant question which we constantly break our heads about because what we are planning for, what we are designing is something which hopefully lasts longer than five years. The bridge is uh, uh, by regulation only there for five years. We know that it can stay to 10 and we constructed it that it can last for 20 years. So that's uh, the reality. So we have to be very aware that uh, although there's a lot of involvement of the current community, there will be generations of other people also having to use it. And there comes in this professional designer which can uh, look ahead and see, well, in 20 years it still should work. And there, there can be parts of that which um, can have a high level of flexibility and, and dynamic interpretation of this space. So we, what we try to balance is to have these public structures for longer, uh, long-term interventions versus uh, really short-term places which can adapt constantly. And you have to find a balance. There's no rule for that. There's no 10 to 10, 10 by 10 law for that. But uh, um, it, it's very specific uh, per per context. Okay. Uh, so let's one. Two and three. And we have about um, 10 minutes left, so uh, please keep your questions uh, and I guess answers as succinct as possible. Hi, I'm Heather Remoff and I'm sort of a community volunteer. And it seems to me that in many of these communities there's an institutional bias in favor of servicing automobiles. I know in my particular community, new building uh, zoning requirements require so many parking spaces. And so I'm curious, these parklets are fabulous, but I know were I to suggest them at a meeting, I'd hear, well, we can't lose parking spaces. So how do you overcome, actually re-educate a community and make the transition from a community that favors parking over people? So with the exception of just two or three parklets, uh, most of them have been in commercial corridors, and commercial corridors are, as a matter of practice in San Francisco, always metered. And so the, the constituencies that are attached to those spots are not residences, they are you know, fronting business entities. And I think that's sort of how we sort of flip that. I mean, yes, you, in a normal circumstance, you, you propose the removal of parking, it's sort of you know, all hell breaks loose, and you know, everyone, if this were a forum, everyone would be yelling and shouting at me. Um, but because there was a, there's a nexus between the, the lot or the benefit of the parklet with those people who are otherwise p losing something, so losing the parking spot, th they see the parklet as being a benefit to them. So the increased use of the street, having more people on the street, having people actually stop and sit and look is actually a good thing for, for businesses. And so there really hasn't been you know, surprisingly, I mean, we'll see as, you know, the next 150 of these, you know, those, you know, as, as, they, as they get implemented, sort of what the reaction will be. But I think sort of create, sort of turning that sort of that resistance on its head and sort of really showing that an alternate use of the space can actually be more beneficial has been sort of one of the virtues of the program. In the back. Um, hi, I'm Zoya. I'm an architect and now a student of landscape architecture at RISD. So I thought all three of you showed really amazing examples of revitalizing the streetscape. But uh, I'm not really familiar with the climatic conditions of the three cities that you showed. But my question is that uh, in either in your cities or in places where the climatic conditions aren't really in conducive most for most part of the year to really like encourage people to be out on the streets, how do you really like strategize to 
prevent these places from falling into decay or when the next cyclical season changes to like bring back the public onto the streets again? Yeah, I would say Rotterdam, I don't know if you've been there once, but mostly it rains, so <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's, it's not the, the most uh, shiny place on earth. Um, so what we try to do again is, is, is to balance interior exterior kind of public space, not in, a, not in a black and white sequence, but to, to add a gradient of types of spaces, which, uh, well, if there's just a little bit of rain, but you can still play, I don't know, a kind of game, then just the coverage is just uh, enough. And then we try to make use for, well, the, of the bridge, which is there uh, to, to make, well, dedicated space for sports which is interior and then if you open the door then it's exterior and um, so yeah we have we are very aware of the of the unsexy uh, uh, days in in these plants you won't find rain on the renderings uh, as you can see so um, but it's, it's again because we are adaptive and we will keep on improving this public space we can see how much we need to uh, to do this Jim, did you want to say a quick word about Chicago, the Windy City? It's, it's like this all the time in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> it's like three months of the year, it's really, really hot. Um, no, you know, I, I don't know. It's an interesting question. I was trying to figure out, like, what's the problem? If nobody goes there, then don't do anything with them. If, you know, if the climate, if the, if the climate is such that, you know, nobody's interested in the spaces, then, okay, let them go. But my guess is that if you follow the human being, if you see what's ha how they're actually being used, there are ways to promote that usage and to promote connectivity within that and to let the space speak to that need. Um, so if the climate is an issue because it's too sunny, then let's make some shade or, you know, I mean, it's just really about the specific environment and it's about the specific way that people are interacting with that specific environment and you have to follow that and you have to do some analysis over time and listen to the people in one way or another, one form or another. So. And I think it's also okay that it's not, they're not used all the time. I mean, we don't, that same question you probably wouldn't ask about a traditional park. I mean, I, and I assume when it's raining and cold, those traditional parks are empty. So it, it's just sort of part of the dynamic of, of outside space in the cities that we live in. That's, you know, hopefully, most of the time they're usable, sometimes they just may not be. There seems to also be just this implicit value that the more crowded a public space is, the better it is, and I'm not sure that's, um, that's all that accurate. Adrian. Yeah, Adrian Benepe from the Trust for Public Land. Sort of uh, building on the last question, anticipating the next session after lunch. Um, do you think that temporary spaces um, might be part of the response to climate change, particularly to rising sea levels and increased flooding incidents, whether they're flooding by rivers or lakes or um, is storm surge or stormwater runoff. Should we be thinking about parks that can literally be rolled up and taken away when you know the flood or the storm is coming? Or things like they do at the beaches where they have these flexible mats they roll out so that people in wheelchairs can get to the water's edge. Should we, be, should we actually be thinking about things that can be transitional or, or transitory in response to weather events? I don't know about the should part, but I think it's super interesting. I mean, I think it's a great point, and I think that uh, what you're saying is that um, there's a new generation of people who are growing up with a lack of faith in the stability of the structures that are being provided to them, and there's an interest in developing an adaptability to their surroundings that probably anticipates some of the specter of climate change and other uh, and accompanying disasters. Yeah, I think, well, it's, it's, a, it's literally a bridge to the next presentation Florian will give you because he will tell probably about a water square uh, next to the bridge. Um, but but that's, a, that's a severe investment uh, in, in public space, so there's nothing temporary about that. But um, on, at the same level, uh, well, you can walk on the bridge when Rotterdam uh, will be flooded, so that's, uh, then you hope that it will stay <laughs> up. on the bridge. Yeah, no, no, but again, um, we have to also in this field do so much of research, on-site research, to see how it works and if it works. Uh, we, uh, one of our projects is a floating 
city on the on the delta, and it's it's also meant to be adaptive in order also to uh, include all the energy and, and potential. It's not only fear, but really the potential of the energy of the storm or the energy of the water to include this in in your uh, structure. So. Uh, there's, there's more vitality in those structures um, than, well, the Robert Moses kind of infrastructural uh, structures. So we're, uh, we're unfortunately just about out of time. Uh, I do want to say just uh, as a summary comment, again, I think one of the things that really separates this panel from a lot of the others is just the degree to which you all are working at, uh, locally, uh, and, um, which is such an ex exciting thing. Uh, and I, we don't have time to discuss it now. I wonder if maybe... Uh, perhaps over lunch, we can discuss the degree to which your work would be conceivable at all. Could you do a test site uh, if you didn't live in Rotterdam, right? Could you do the Red Moon Theater? Could you do these parklets? Because it's so much of um, working with the local and working what's there. Um, so I think that, that there's a big question there that unfortunately we don't have time to discuss now, but uh, I think it's worth dis discussing at some point. Um, thank you all for being patient and for your great questions.